markets classically fail in cases where there are there are public goods that uh, that uh, that uh, provide benefits that people cannot uh, cannot capture. The uh, big debate is how big these public goods are, where they exist, uh, things of that sort. Um, I do tend to think that things that have incredibly long time horizons often do involve uh, market failures. So if you think about basic science or coming up with um, new theories of mathematics, these are not the kinds of things for which there necessarily um, is a, is a well-defined market uh, to pay people. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, I think uh, one of the places where I would disagree with Gates is that uh, it is not at all clear to me that we, that we have a government that uh, is doing this much better. And, uh, and so uh, even though I think markets are often uh, not thinking on a, on a long time horizon, I think that uh, our government structurally is doing even less so. If when, where you have a government where people are up for election at most uh, once every six uh, years, which is for, for a U.S. senator, uh, that's a time horizon that's much shorter than, uh, than in a market where you know, a company is looking at 10, 15, 20 years, which is a time horizon over which its stock price is typically valued. There's a lot that can be done with the market. I think uh, we want people to have long-term time horizons. Uh, and, and so I think uh, to some extent it is a, there's a cultural question. There's people should be thinking of, you know, their li life is long. It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't end in six months or in three years, whatever the next line on your resume is. It's something that for uh, most of us, uh, we can expect to go on for you know, quite a number of decades ahead. And so I think, uh, I think somehow uh, people should be encouraged to think about uh, a very long time horizon. And uh, I think this is true for uh, businesses, it's true for governments, and it's, uh, it's true for uh, people doing things in the nonprofit sector. Technology and capitalism are, are very much uh, linked. Uh, I, would, um, I, would, I would frame the link a little bit differently. I think that uh, capitalism uh, probably works best in a technologically progressing society. Um, in the developed world, uh, technological progress means that you can, um, you can have a situation where, where people, uh, where there's growth, where there's uh, a way in which everybody can be better off over time. If you have technological progress, that will encourage a more capitalist system. On the other hand, if you don't, if things are, are stalled, you end up with much more of a, uh, of a zero-sum type thing where there's no progress and basically uh, everybody's gain is somebody else's loss. And that, uh, I think, tends to encourage a much less capitalist system. Um, and that's where you sort of get a, you know, what I've often called a bull market in politics, where politics becomes more important. People become more interested in using the government to uh, get things for their particular interest group. And, uh, and the whole thing can sort of spiral downwards instead of uh, and become a vicious cycle where uh, more government regulation leads to less technology, leads to demand for even more politics to redistribute uh, the pie that's no longer growing. We have seen uh, technological progress in the last few decades in computers, the internet. Uh, we've seen a lot less in areas like transportation. So, you know, the fastest uh, airplanes was the Concorde in 1970, and they've gotten slower over the last 40 years. Uh, medicine, healthcare has seen some progress, but it's been pretty limited the last 20 years where the uh, development of new drugs and uh, uh, treatment seems to have been badly stalled. Uh, energy is an area where there's been very limited progress and the, the actual cost of oil was $3 a barrel in 1973. Today it's around $85 a barrel. Even inflation adjusted, uh, the, the real prices have gone up because uh, somehow we've not been making enough progress in developing the technologies for alternative and cheaper uh, types of energies. As a libertarian, I, I tend to think uh, um, it's interesting, at least, that a lot of these sectors correlate with places where uh, there's heavy government regulation. A uh, government has not regulated the compu computer industry or the internet. They thought that you know Bill Gates working with his computer uh, in his parents' garage uh, was not a really interesting or important thing, not worthy of scrutiny or regulation. It didn't matter. That's been the same perspective people had have by and large had with respect to the internet since the uh, mid '90s, and so you've had a lot of progress and innovation there. Um, Health care, on the other hand, has been subject to massive regulation. You've uh, strangely had the most progress in some ways uh, where you uh, have cheaper treatments at, uh, at better quality in, in things uh, like cosmetic surgery and things like that, which are 
less regulated, and again deemed to be unimportant by the government. So I think uh, the regulatory load on technology has gotten to be quite high, and there is this very important question of how much uh, progress we're likely to see in the next few decades. From my perspective, the, uh, the critical thing is actually to figure out a way to get uh, the technology engine restarted. Um, I think that we would like to have less government regulation to enable that, um, and if it gets restarted, you can have a more, uh, more capitalist type system. But I, I do think that if technology is stalled out, uh, we will probably uh, see at some point a resumption of the trend towards, uh, towards more government, even though it's unlikely, uh, in my opinion, to actually fix things. Technology is probably the single biggest driver of productivity gains over a period of several decades for the developed countries. It's, it's for example, I think much more important than free trade. I'm in favor of free trade, but I think if you had to make a choice between having technological progress versus free trade, and you had one or the other, you should always pick technological progress. So I think it's an incredibly important variable for uh, creating more prosperity. The developing world does not, does not really do need to develop new technologies. For China or India, uh, the next 20 years, the plan is basically to catch up to the U.S., to get 19th century plumbing and 20th century railroads, and, to, uh, and basically just to copy. That is not a strategy that works for the developed world if we're going to try to improve living standards in the developed world. So the developing world can just do things that are extensive or horizontal, that basically uh, copy. The um, developed world needs to do things that are intensive or vertical, where we take our civilization to, uh, to the next level. And to the extent people don't believe this is going to happen, um, you see a lot more pessimism about the future. When you have these surveys of people and they ask, you know, will the next generation of Americans be better off than the current one or worse off, more and more people believe that it will be worse off uh, than, and it's a lot more than, say, would have thought this in the late 1960s when people believed there was incredible technological progress and people would, you know, be, we'd be on the moon by 1980 in a permanent lunar base and by Mars 1990, by 2001 it was Space Odyssey, you'd be at Jupiter, and you know, from there it would be on to the stars. And, and, uh, and that's not the kind of future people expect, and I think that's one of the reasons they're so uh, pessimistic. It's not, it's not articulated in quite this way, uh, but if people were super optimistic about technology, um, there would be uh, no reason to be pessimistic about the future. A lot of the political debates we have in the U.S. Uh, today, for example, about um, deficit spending, the debt, um, austerity, um, would not be problems if we had technological progress. If you doubled the debt over the next 20 years in the U.S. and the size of the economy doubled because of technological progress and growth, um, the two would roughly cancel out and it would all be a totally manageable situation. Um, on the other hand, uh, one of the reasons I think people are increasingly nervous about all this borrowing is because they think uh, that uh, we're not actually digging ourselves out of a hole, but instead are digging ourselves into a deeper and deeper hole and will not be able to pay it back because we're not actually creating the uh, new technologies that will enable us to, uh, to pay it back and the money somehow not really being, being invested in the future or in progress. It's quite unclear where we are headed. We've, we, we certainly had a bit of an experiment of going towards, towards uh, more government over the last, uh, the last few years. Uh, the experiment doesn't seem to be to be working uh, to be working terribly well. Um, on the other hand, it's it's also quite unclear uh, if we go to if we go back towards less government that's going to work. In the U.S., we fundamentally need to do uh, new things, which I think is harder for the government to do, um, and moreover, it is not something our government actually is inclined to, to particularly do. Um, you know, our government is not dominated by engineers, it is dominated by lawyers. Uh, engineers are interested in substance and building things. Lawyers are interested in process and rights and getting the ideology uh, correct, uh, correctly blended. And, uh, and so there is sort of no uh, really concrete uh, plan for the future. Um, what it is, a, I think, a striking failure on the part of, uh, of the left especially, which is pushing for for more and more government, that uh, there's actually nothing specific that the money would be spent on. If you had uh, if you had Obama go on TV and say that we need to have a manned base on the moon, or that uh, or that uh, we will we will defeat cancer in five years, a la Kennedy or a la Nixon, uh, this would just strike people as bizarre. 
And so uh, the sort of the, um, the governing class in the U.S. Uh, is not focused on technology, does not believe it. And so even if you need government to, uh, to uh, create technology and to build it in the most developed countries, and even if it's the space race where it was heavily government funded is the correct paradigm, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, our uh, political leadership does not believe in this. Technology innovation is still, um, the best place is still uh, Silicon Valley and California is still the best place for uh, technology innovation, which is, uh, which is the business that I'm in and am, um, am you know, going to be in for, uh, for, for the decades ahead. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the worry is obviously that uh, this engine gets regulated or constrained and, uh, and, and slows down. And in that case, I think uh, you have uh, you know, even worse problems in California and the U.S., but they are problems that probably extend uh, to much of the developed world. The uh, seasteading initiative that uh, we've been uh, talking about for the last uh, few years is, is a bit of an experimental uh, project. It's uh, run by uh, uh, this guy, Patrick Friedman, the uh, grandson of uh, Milton Friedman, the, the, the um, famous uh, uh, economist. Uh, it's uh, this idea about can you create experimental new types of communities on, on the oceans. Uh, I, think, I think from a technological perspective, something like seasteading is an important frontier for us to look at. We need to be looking at um, all the unexplored frontiers that have not uh, been, been taken. And if you sort of go back to the 1960s, uh, people thought of space as the, the final frontier, but uh, they also had uh, all these uh, ideas about exploring and developing the oceans, which cover 70% of the Earth's surface and are largely undeveloped, um, uh, plans to turn deserts into arable land and reforesting the deserts. And, uh, and so there are all these sort of frontiers that, are, uh, that we think are, are very underdeveloped and it is worth trying to go back to that, uh, that spirit of trying to, uh, to uh, move the frontier of, uh, of, uh, of, of human knowledge and progress. The term we've used is that people should stop out of school for, uh, for two years. Uh, the uh, program uh, is a, uh, we've called 20 Under 20, it's under, at 20under20.org, my, my one advertisement I'll get in, in here. Uh, and it is a uh, it is a two year fellowship program where we will pay people um, hundred thousand dollars for two years to uh, to pursue some particular passion, preferably in a technological area where they can work individually or in a team of up to four people in starting a company or joining some other early stage company. Uh, we will encourage people to do this from California because that's where we think we can help provide them with some mentorship. Um, but we think that, uh, that the idea of becoming an entrepreneur is something that uh, is not taught very well in school and is something that's, uh, that people should try to do earlier on. Uh, one of the concerns that I've had about the educational system is that the enormous amounts of debt it's putting on people is actually constraining people's ability to do things that are not as remunerative. And uh, so people are, are sort of tracked into these professional jobs. They're not able to do things that are entrepreneurial or nonprofit or just, you know, just fun or socially useful and, uh, and sort of are, are overly uh, narrowly constrained. And I think technological innovation uh, requires risk, it requires sacrifice, and it may very, be very hard to do that if you have um, you know, an, this enormous debt burden to try to repay. It's hard to start a great company if you've bought a big house. And uh, it may be hard to start a big company if you're burdened down with uh, enormous amounts of, uh, of student loans. And so, so um, it's, I think there's sort of a context that's specific to our time where we think, uh, we think uh, education needs to be rethought, uh, that education does not just happen in college, but it also happens in uh, developing skills in which, uh, that will enable people uh, to contribute to, uh, to our society as, as a whole. Um, Eduardo was one of the uh, early people at uh, Facebook. He was uh, he was uh, he worked with Zuckerberg in getting the site started and was responsible for uh, trying to get uh, advertising revenues for the company in in 2004 and also helped provide um, uh, some of the very early uh, seed capital in uh, getting the business started. Uh, I think the uh, portrayal of, of the film is probably slightly too favorable to Eduardo and slightly too unfavorable towards the people who actually uh, put in uh, the incredibly hard work of, uh, of building Facebook over, over uh, many, many years. Uh, it, uh, it, 
you know, it's uh, it's sort of a bit of a caricature of capitalism that it's always this zero-sum game where you have winners and losers. Uh, um, that's cer certainly the way a lot of Hollywood works, uh, and where it's this uh, thing where there only are so many celebrities, and you can only uh, become a new celebrity by tearing somebody else uh, down. Silicon Valley, the technology industry at its best, creates a, a situation where everybody can be a winner. And I think Facebook is a extreme example of this, where um, all the people, uh, the uh, early employees, the late employees, the investors, and uh, the world as a whole has benefited tremendously. Uh, all the stakeholders have done have done really well, including Eduardo. Uh, uh, I think the the uh, issue the movie was alluding to was in the summer of 2004 when I invested in Facebook. Um, it had it was structured as a partnership, which is uh, not a way you can actually build a tech company where you have everybody has a fixed equity percentage. You need to have some flexibility. You need to have vesting schedules where the people who are actually working on the company get equity over time. Uh, and, uh, and so a lot of effort was spent uh, reorganizing the company from a partnership into a corporation. And I think this sort of structural reorganization in which uh, uh, Sean Parker played a critical role um, in the summer of 2004 um, was indispensable towards uh, creating, uh, creating this much, much larger company that exists today and, uh, and uh, in which um, Eduardo's stake is worth uh, far more than it otherwise would have been. Well, uh, I think, you know, Eduardo's made uh, on the order of a billion dollars uh, at the current Facebook valuation, and uh, he, should, he should just uh, see that as, uh, you know, that he's, he's done incredibly well, and he should try to figure out a way to, uh, to, um, to uh, invest that money and contribute it to things that will uh, make the world a better place in the decades ahead. Mm -hmm.